It, it, people went from this little <laughs> tiny newsy thing, very polite still, into now what we have. I mean, I saw in the airport this morning as I went through maybe 10 of these trash celebrity magazines where they're invading people's private life, uh, taking pictures of people doing just ordinary everyday things. And that may be very interesting for some people, but for the poor person who is the victim who never can leave their house without making sure they're not, they're, they're looking well and they're not because the, all they're looking for is the picture where you're not looking good, where you've got your finger up your nose or whatever. <laughs> and so it, it, it makes your life artificial. It makes you a prisoner. You can't be an ordinary, free, happy person going out and doing regular things. And that was one of the things that really got to me when I married Pierre, that because personal freedom was something so important to me. And I saw that I was being imprisoned. I was isolated at 24 Sussex. I call it the crown jewel of the federal penitentiary. <laughs> and I, I was guarded all the time. I always had these nice big mounties with me. And I, 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 people behaved differently towards Pierre and I. Um, we'd walk up to people who were just laughing and having a good time. It's like a good crowd to go and see Pierre. Oh, hello, hello. And they, oh, they'd lose, they'd become nervous, they'd lose their ability to respond to us as human beings. So I found it very, very isolating uh, being put up on, on, in this, on this pedestal. I also found it very difficult uh, because I, I was raised, uh, being modest was really important. I mean, we, I had four sisters, so you didn't get away with bragging or thinking of yourself as anything uh, fancy or special. And I, I didn't know why I was getting so much attention because I wasn't famous. I was just married to someone who was famous. And then when I was being attacked all the time, I thought, but I don't have any responsibility to constituents. Nobody voted me in. I mean, I, the only person I've made promises to is my husband, not to all of you. So I, I found it very difficult to live in the, under the spotlight, to be a celebrity. And I know that now, now, of course, I don't have a problem because look at me, I'm 62, who cares? But the young girls, <laughs> the young ones are getting it, uh, what I had just a bit of, they're getting it every single day because each picture, I think for the big stars, the ones that they're picking on all the time, 150,000 per picture is usually the going thing. So if someone can get the picture and get it out on the, and, get, and sell it, they make a lot of money. So it's become a business. It's nothing human or interesting. And so I, I, find, uh, I found that the hardest part. The stress of that was quite, quite difficult. Yeah. I, I think that's a really good observation that you were the first person in Canada to actually feel what it felt like to, the, what's common now, the yes. tabloid coverage. Yeah. Um, did you find then, and do you find today, with you have an eye for it now, that women are subjected to a different standard in the, this kind of coverage than men? What was your first clue? <laughs> Absolutely, absolutely. And the other thing that I think that happened to me was because I was a, a, a political wife, and therefore it means that there are people who are politically opposed to my husband. Um, I, Pierre was pretty tough on the press. They couldn't get to him. Uh, he had the answer to them, and he would call them stupid if they hadn't done their homework. He just pushed them away and whatever. Uh, his Achilles tendon turned out to be me. And uh, they used me, I think, to get to him, uh, meanly, cruelly. And uh, sometimes uh, it was very, very unfair. And, I, I, and it hurt him a lot. He loved me very much. He loved me as, as, the, as his wife and as the mother of his, his children. And to he, see me hurt, hurt him more than anything. He could take it. He, he was tough and whole and strong. And I was a very vulnerable young woman who uh, had three babies in six years. Uh, one of the things that I've learned is that women's mental health is very different from men's mental health because of their, our hormones. Uh, um, for me, all my worst crises with my bipolar were triggered uh, by fluctuations or changes in my hormones. My first depression, as you know, was uh, right after the birth of my second child. It was called postpartum, it was called baby blue. 
blues that, oh no, you'll get better. I don't pass. It wasn't baby blues. It was the beginning of my journey with bipolar, although I'd had little indications it was coming. It was the first deep, deep depression. And uh, of course, depression with, uh, is followed with bipolar because that's why it's called manic depression. As deeply as you fall into depression, you will climb up into mania. Well, isn't mania nice after you've been deeply depressed? <laughs> But it's the dangerous part of the, of the condition. It's the one where all the, the damage is done. I sometimes describe it as a nuclear bomb going off in our family life at everything. Because you, with the mania, you have such impaired insight. Your mind is racing so fast that you can't ever think ahead. You're impulsive, you're compulsive, and you don't think of the consequences of anything you do. You feel, I felt sometimes I had a thousand watt volts coming through my fingers. I felt I had a connection to God. There's often a religious delusion with mania, and nobody could tell me that there was anything wrong with me. If you think something's wrong with me, there's something wrong with you, I would say. <laughs> but because I was all powerful, I, what was the reality was that there was so much dopamine and it's a chemical imbalance bipolar. There was such a surge of the chemical dopamine in my brain that uh, too much, way too much dopamine is responsible for our creativity, our wit, our our artistic endeavors, our, our love of music, our emotions, a lot, wonderful. Dopamine is a wonderful, wonderful chemical in our brain in the right measure. But when you're manic, you're just, it's just flooding your brain and you are impulsive, you don't sleep, you don't eat. When I'm manic, I usually weigh 30 pounds less than I weigh right now. And that's how I was when I was finally put into the hospital t uh, in, in 2000 after Pierre's death. Um, I was in totally emaciated because of my metabolism was so high and of course I would forget to eat because you don't connect one thought to the next you don't remember to sometimes I thought I didn't even remember to breathe but that that's the the, the bipolar predicament is that, that it goes from depression to ma mania and then back to depression and and one of the things that triggers you so deeply into depression when you come out of the mania is a tremendous sense of guilt and shame oh my gosh what have I done what have I done and you can't take Take back those words that spew out of you, that you, you have no control over, the things that you do, the actions that you, you take no account of, of how our consideration of. And it's not because I was a bad person. It was because I, had, I couldn't think any other way. My thinking was so wrong. But I didn't know that. And you try and tell a manic person that they're, they're really uh, in trouble and that they need serious help. And they will fight to the end to deny that. Uh, because the mania becomes the addictive part of the bipolar. You, after the long, long stretches of depression where all the light is gone from your life, you don't feel any interest. That's the, that's the chemical serotonin and others, but serotonin is the big one that will, when it's gone in your brain and it gets depleted with depression, it's a conductor that passes the neuron as transmit their messages through it. So you never have a click because uh, there's no, no conductor. You look at something beautiful, the lovely eyes of a child, uh, you read a beautiful poem, it means means nothing to you because there's no click in your brain. There's no way, ability for the brain to pass the message from one neuron to the next, transmit the message. So it, it, it's a very, depression is, is not sadness. It's not sorrow. It's, it's really beyond that. It's a dark, dark gray place where you lose your interest, you lose your spark. When I started, uh, started my journey with bipolar, it was after the birth of, of Sasha. And I was the most happy mother with Justin. I mean, he was a prince. I loved every minute of the first year of my life with, with Pierre, the pregnancy, the second year with my beautiful little baby. And he really was a wonderful, wonderful, wonderful firstborn. Sasha came along, and it was nothing to do with Sasha. Uh, I just fell into this. I didn't want to get out of bed. I was just weeping. I, I didn't want to play with the children. And then everybody started noticing that I was backing off. I wasn't contributing anymore. I wasn't going into the nursery. I, the, the they would bring me the baby, I would feed him, and then I'd just give him back. I, I, I just was a different person. Pierre thought, the spark's gone out of you. What's happened, Margaret? The light's gone. And so we went to a psychiatrist. I didn't feel, I, I was pretty free at thinking uh, after uh, my education, which was a very free thinking education, a radical one at Simon Fraser University. And I, I, I didn't think any there was any problem with mental illness. I didn't even, I, 
give it a second thought. I said, Pierre, there must be something wrong with me. We have to see a psychiatrist. So we did see a psychiatrist. And the psychiatrist, unfortunately, was much more interested in the gentleman who was next to me than me. <laughs> he was in awe. And he